Once again, a hearty welcome to you who have taken time to view this series of Know Your Church. In previous episodes, we have dealt with the commandments, the Church of Christ, the ministry, the sacraments, and life after death. And now we come to the final episode of this series in which we delve into the future events in the salvation plan of God. As we have mentioned on a number of occasions before, God's actions are aimed at making salvation accessible to mankind, and this applies to all people in the past, the present, and the future. The history of salvation develops according to the wise plan of God, and the knowledge that God is faithful enables us to confidently wait for the fulfillment of further divine promises. The doctrine of what is to come in the future is known as eschatology, and our knowledge of future things is based on Holy Scripture. Many references to events in the future of the salvation plan are contained in the Gospels and the letters of the Apostles. Some key statements are recorded in the revelation of Jesus Christ, which speaks of future things in a figurative way. In this important source of hope for the future, the Lord repeatedly reinforces the promise of His return, reveals the progress of the history of salvation, and thereby grants insights into His future actions. The second article of faith professes, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, our Lord, who ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where He will return. This profession is further expanded in the ninth article of faith. I believe that the Lord Jesus will return as surely as He ascended into heaven, and that He will take to Himself the first fruits of the dead and living who have hoped for and were prepared for His coming. Jesus Christ will return. This is a core statement of the Gospel. Ever since His ascension into heaven, the apostles of the early and latter time have proclaimed the return of the Lord. To be accepted by Him at this event is the goal of faith of new apostolic Christians. In his farewell conversations, Jesus Christ gave his apostles the promise of his return. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We read in John 14 verse 3. This promise of the Lord was reinforced by angels at his ascension into heaven. This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. We read in Acts 1 verse 11. No man or angel, but only God alone, knows the day or the hour of Jesus Christ's return. The Son of God repeatedly admonishes watchfulness, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, referred to Matthew 24, verse 42. Through parables, the Son of God made it clear that one should at all times be watchful in faith and await His coming, referred to Matthew 24, verses 43 to 51. The early apostles already encouraged the faithful to prepare themselves for the return of the Lord. For example, Apostle Paul addressed the congregation of Corinth with the early Christian call, Maranatha, which means, Our Lord is coming. Read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. The call to be watchful is also expressed in the book of Revelation. There Jesus Christ says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Revelations 3, verse 11, 22, verse 7 and 12, and 20. With this we see that all believers are called on to diligently live their lives, bearing the return of Christ in mind. 
The expectation that the Lord's promises will be fulfilled, together with the hope of personally experiencing Christ's return and being caught up to Him, also remain at the core of the new apostolic faith today. In 1 John 3 verse 2, we read concerning this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. The events that will take place at the return of Christ are described in various letters of Apostle Paul. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 to 17 we read, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52 further informs us, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In addition, we see in Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. These Bible passages are of central significance for belief in the return of Christ. Let us put the events of the return of Christ in sequence. First, the dead in Christ will resurrect incorruptible. Secondly, the living who have allowed themselves to be prepared for His coming will then experience the transformation without suffering physical death. Thus, both the dead and the living will receive a body that is like the glorious body of Christ. They will then be caught up together to the Lord, who will not descend upon the earth. In this manner, they will be led into eternal fellowship, with the triune God. These events are part of the first resurrection mentioned in Revelation 20 verses 5 to 6. The statements in Matthew 24 verses 40 and 41 and Luke 17 verses 34 demonstrate that at the return of Christ the Lord will usher in a separation, a parting, and in this sense also execute a judgment. The words in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 also address this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This knowledge does not lead believers to fear, but rather encourages them to strive diligently for the goal of their faith. That Jesus Christ will take his bridal congregation unto himself is one of the fundamental certainties of the new apostolic faith. From this knowledge, believers also derive the hope that they will not need to suffer physical death, but will rather be transformed. The rapture at the return of Christ is first of all promised to those who have been granted the rebirth out of water and the Spirit, who believe in Christ and follow Him. Whether God will also grant other human beings the grace of the rapture is beyond human understanding and is subject to the decision of God Himself.
Let us focus a bit more on this bridal congregation that Jesus Christ will take unto himself when he returns. It is the commission of the apostles to prepare the church of Christ for the reunion with Jesus at his return. In accordance with the words of Apostle Paul, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This we read in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. This chaste virgin is a reference to the bride, an image for the future community of the saints, of which we read in Revelation 19 verse 7. Those who are numbered to the bride of the Lord will only be revealed at the return of Christ. One of the identifying characteristics of those who will belong to the bride is that they will wait daily for the return of Christ and consistently cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Representing this community of the saints, we also find the images of the 144,000, referred to Revelation 14, verse 1 to 5, and the male child, Revelation 12, verse 5. These images indicate important characteristics and conditions. We read as follows concerning the 144,000. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The number 144,000 is symbolic. It is derived from the 12 tribes of Israel and represents divine perfection. The identifying mark bearing the name of the Lamb and of the Father signifies that the 144,000 are the property of God. By following Christ, they lead a life in accordance with the gospel in both word and deed. They are also described as firstlings, in the Greek text, first fruits. The first fruits are all those whom the Lord takes unto himself at his return, in figurative terms, those whom he harvests. Revelation 12 speaks of a woman clothed with the sun, an image for the church of Christ, who is about to give birth to a male child. The male child is threatened by a dragon, but he is caught up to God. He symbolizes the host of those who will be caught up to God at the return of Christ. The dragon is an image for Satan, Revelation 12 verse 9. He can prevent neither the perfection nor the rapture of the bridal congregation. The marriage of the Lamb follows directly after the bride has been caught up to heaven. The image of the marriage feast that is to come is found in Revelation 19 verses 6 to 9. It refers to the everlasting fellowship of the firstlings with their Lord and their partaking in His glory. Refer also to Colossians 3 verse 4. The image of the Lamb is already used in Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 7. It demonstrates that the coming Messiah will bring His sacrifice in submissiveness to the will of God for the redemption of mankind. John the Baptist refers to the Son of God with the words, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, refer to John 1 verse 29. The book of Revelation makes frequent reference to Christ as the Lamb. Revelation 5 verse 12 expresses that the slain Lamb has gained the victory. This means that the humiliated and crucified Son of God is both the triumphant and victorious one. The crucified Christ is the returning Lord, the Bridegroom. During the marriage of the Lamb, 
the people remaining on the earth will have to endure the rule of Satan, the great tribulation. Now, as long as the Lord's work of salvation is on this earth, the earthly creation remains under the special protection of God. However, after the return of Christ, a time will begin in which both mankind and the creation will be exposed to the power of Satan. Everything will suffer under the circumstances associated with this. This period of time can be associated with the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, as referenced in Revelation 3 verse 10. Holy Scripture also refers to this event as the Great Tribulation. Read Revelation 7 verse 14. Satan's display of power in the Great Tribulation far surpasses the trials and the severity of hardships which the church had to endure before the return of the Lord. The bridal congregation will be caught up to God before the start of the Great Tribulation. The image of the woman clothed with the sun, after she has given birth to the male child, represents those who are numbered to the Church of Christ, but who were not caught up to God. They will continue to feel God's support and spiritual care in the wilderness. That is a condition of hardship and deprivation. Read Revelation 12, verse 6. Even during this time, in which Satan and his forces will rule, there will be human beings who firmly profess Christ, who refuse to worship the Antichrist, and who will be killed as a consequence of their profession. These steadfast witnesses for Christ will become martyrs. After the marriage in heaven, the Son of God will return to the earth with the firstlings, the Lord foretold this event by referring to His coming with power and great glory. Jesus Christ will then reveal His divine power on earth for all to see. He, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will take away all power from Satan and his followers and thus put an end to the time of the great tribulation. Satan's followers will be judged and Satan himself will be bound for a thousand years, so that he should deceive the nations no more. After Satan has been bound and cast into the bottomless pit, the resurrection of the martyrs from the great tribulation will take place. Let us now for a moment discuss the topic of the first resurrection, the only place in Holy Scripture where the expression first resurrection can be found is in Revelation 20 verses 5 to 6, where it is mentioned in conjunction with a significant beatitude. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. Those who are praised here as blessed and holy that is, those who will be caught up to God at the return of Christ and the martyrs from the Great Tribulation are exempted from the last judgment. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 and 22 verse 24, Apostle Paul makes reference to the order in the resurrection of the dead. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Apostle Paul thus highlights three important aspects. Christ was the first to resurrect. He is the first fruits of those who will resurrect. All hope for the resurrection of the dead is founded upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection afterward is promised to those who belong to Christ 
when He comes. At His return, the dead in Christ will resurrect and will then be caught up to God along with the transformed living souls. In connection with Christ's coming with power and great glory, the martyrs from the great tribulation are promised resurrection. These two events frame the first resurrection. The following applies to all those who partake in it. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with Him a thousand years. We read in Revelation 20 verse 6. The end of which Apostle Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 is a reference to the last judgment. Before this, the general resurrection of the dead will take place. After the conclusion of the first resurrection, Christ will establish his kingdom of peace on earth. Then the rule of Jesus Christ as king will be manifested without restriction. He is the prince of peace, we read in Isaiah 9 verse 6. Satan will be bound and will no longer be able to tempt anyone to sin. Nevertheless, human beings will continue to be sinners since the inclination to sin will not have been lifted. People will continue to be born and to die. Death will not yet have been suspended. Exempted from this are the priests of God and Christ, who will have a spiritual body similar to that of the Lord. Refer to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 44. Christ's kingly rule, in which he includes his own as a royal priesthood, will last a thousand years, which symbolizes a long but limited time. Refer to Revelations 20 verse 6. It will then be possible to proclaim the gospel without hindrances, and salvation will thus be offered during this time. The glad tidings will be brought to those living on earth and to souls who dwell in the realms of the departed. In this way, all of mankind for all time periods will, by the end of the kingdom of peace, have become acquainted with the gospel of Christ. The kingdom of peace will come to an end when Satan is released and given one last opportunity to tempt mankind. After his ultimate defeat, he will be condemned and cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Refer to Revelations 20 verses 7 to 10. Evil in all its manifestations will then have been rendered powerless forever. Then follows the resurrection of the dead for judgment. Refer to Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Christ will then judge all human beings who did not take part in the first resurrection. The deciding factor in the verdict pronounced on each human being will be the attitude that he ultimately adopts towards Christ. Those who reject him and whose names are not written in the book of life will remain in the misery of remoteness from God. Those who find grace in the last judgment will become inhabitants of God's new creation and will be permitted to have eternal fellowship with Him. For those who already reigned with Christ in the kingdom of peace as a royal priesthood, the following promise will be fulfilled in the new creation. And His servants shall serve Him. They shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. Read Revelation 22 verses 3 to 5. The expectation recorded in 2 Peter 3 verse 13 will then become reality. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. God will replace the old creation with a new one, and the words will be fulfilled. He, God, will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, 
God himself will be with them and be their God. Revelation 21 verse 3. This kingdom of God will be eternal and then God will be all in all. And appropriately on that note, we have come to the end of series two of Know Your Church. I certainly hope you have enjoyed the time spent with us as we discuss the fundamental aspects of our faith. May the knowledge gained prove to be a great blessing in the time that lies ahead. Goodbye for now, and God bless.